Hi, I'm Aaron Dablo, and this is a video tutorial uh, covering simple tool creation for 3D Studio Max. This video is going to cover uh, various ways to make simple, quick, but powerful tools in 3D Studio Max that will save you a lot of clicks. I sort of have the mantra that if I do something three times, I'll make a script to do it instead. This is going to get you started down that path with learning simple ways to uh, listen to what's going on under the hood in 3D Studio Max and put that to use for you. To start off with, we're going to cover the Max Script Listener, which, as I said, is going to print out Max Script code uh, for the tasks that you're doing. Then I'm going to cover some basic syntax so you can understand what these things are doing and learn how to simply edit them to do what you need. Also, we're going to cover a little bit of basic programming stuff, like variables and arrays. And then we're going to cover uh, ways to loop, uh, do I loops and things through your code. Then after we've done loops and maybe a couple tests, uh, I'll show you how to make a simple UI or just put this bit of code into a toolbar inside 3D Studio Max. All in all, it's a very quick introductory level, so don't get scared off by the, by the coding. It's uh, a great way to really augment and speed up your uh, workflow. Here we are in a fresh 3ds Max scene. If I go ahead and make a teapot in the scene here, you can see that down here in this corner, it has started to read some things. This is the Max Script Listener window. You can access it by pressing F11, and you can see that we have a pink pane and a white pane. This pink pane is the listener, or the macro recorder. If you click on here and enable, it will start listening to your scene and it'll print out what happens in MacScript. So let's see what happens again if I make a teapot. You can see that it's starting to report what I've made. Here's the teapot, and if I go ahead and move it, you can see that it's printing off what's going on in the scene as little actions. This is the macro recorder and is a great way to get started understanding what's happening in MacScript. So let's go ahead and make a teapot. And here we go. You can see that we've made this teapot. And then holding down shift, I'll drag it and I'll make a couple copies. And now we have several teapots. This is going to be our proxy for a complicated scene. If I go to the modifier panel on these teapots, you can see that they have a few attributes that you can edit. Handle, spout, lid, body. You can turn all of this stuff on or off. And you can see, in Max, it has been listening to what's been going on. This is the start of what we're going to do for our very first script. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this, close our listener window, and I'm going to open up the Max script window. If I go to Max script, new script, I'll have my fresh window here, and I'm just going to paste that code in there. So let's just take a basic quick look at this, and it should make a little bit of sense. Starting with this code, you can see that it almost speaks plain English. We have a handle, and it equals off. That makes sense, because we turn the handle off. What is this dollar sign? This is Max's way of saying, what you have selected, its handle is going to be off. If I just go ahead and edit this and turn it on, and I go to Tools, Evaluate All, you can see that the handle has turned back on. Let's do this again with the lid. Tools, Evaluate All. We've got our lid back. Through this way, we can edit exactly what we want for all of our objects. Now, because I said that this dollar sign stands for our selection, if I select multiple objects and do Tools, execute. It runs on everything I have selected. A quicker way to do this is to just hit Control E. If I go back and turn these back on, you can see that just by running that script, I'm able to turn things on and off. Now the listener will be printing out values like this for whatever you do, uh, or for most things that you do, and you can kind of get a good idea of what you're dealing with. We understand our syntax for what the dollar sign means. Let's go ahead and make a variable here. So uh, what a variable is, is essentially a little bit of memory that holds a value. So what this variable is, it is pointing to this value. If I copy this variable and apply it to these 
attributes and then execute my code, you can see that it on has been applied to all of these. And this may look like an unnecessary step, but now I can easily edit my code and perform a bunch of operations. So this is pretty much our first script. This is the teapotcontrol.ms. There are other attributes that can be edited for each teapot. For example, dollars.wirecolor If I execute this on one, you can see that its wire color has changed to red. You can, you can edit almost anything through MaxScript, and you can find all of it in the help file. This help file is very, very robust, and it has a wonderful selection of tutorials and things that you can find to learn more on what you're looking for than what we're going to cover here. So, just how we were able to replace the uh, value over here with a variable, we can treat our selection as something special also. So I'm going to go ahead and open the listener window. We can do this by pressing F11. And we're going to use a function called print. It will return the value of the variable that we are presenting max. So if I type print dollars and execute, you'll see here that it has listed teapots 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. When you have multiple things in one variable, that's considered an array. Each array has an index, which is its number. If I print dollars bracket 2, you'll see that it's just going to return one of the teapots. It, it prints the line twice, but you can see we only have teapot 3 once. And if I print 4, you can see we get a different teapot. So this is really great for being able to access single objects within our array. Let's visualize this. Let's say dollars four, so the fourth thing in our array, dot wire color equals blue. And there you can see one of our objects has turned blue. So now I'm going to show you how to recursively loop through a selection. This is one of the most powerful things that you can do in MaxScript, and it is one of the most simple things as well. It lets you perform an action, or a set of actions, or anything on a group of objects, which is what MaxScript is really, really useful for, because it can save you a bunch of time. So, for our simple loop, instead of just applying an action to our selection, let's loop through our objects in the array and do an action to each one. So this is a for loop. For i in 1 to selection dot count do. So this is the basic part of the for loop. What it is telling Mac script is for the variable in 1 through our so total selection the number of them, please do what's in the brackets. So one by one, so by one, in our selection, it will do something to this object. And what we're going to tell it to do is turn off the lid. So I'll say dollars i dot lid equals false. Dollars and selection are interchangeable. They mean the same thing and i is the number of the loop. Because we have one, two, three, four, five objects selected, it will do this action five times on inserting the number one, two, three, four, and five, depending on which iteration it is through the loop. So hitting control E, you can see that it has turned off the lids. Now you may, might wonder why this is important because we were already able to turn them off directly before. Well, what this opens up for us is the ability to do a test and perform a different action within our loop. So let's turn back on the lids for a couple of these objects and we'll set up a simple test in our for loop. If dollars i dot lid is true, 
then do an action. So what this is telling MaxScript to do is saying for the object in our loop that we are on, take a look at its lid. Now before we were setting things with just one equal sign, that was making this equal this. If you put two, it will test to see if this is equal to this. It's essentially taking the value that we already have on this and comparing it to this. If that test is a positive one, then it will execute what's in this bracket. And if not, we have another bracket. This bracket is optional, but we're going to use it here to show you what you can do with a test of this sort. Let's go ahead and change the wire color of the object depending on if it has a lid or not. So I'll do dollars i dot wire color equals blue for if it does have a lid. Let's go ahead and copy this. and make it red if it doesn't. I'm going to select my objects and execute the code and you can see that it's looped through each of our objects, seen if it has a lid or not, and then change the wire color appropriately. With just these simple tools of if then and i loops, you can process huge amounts of data that would end up costing you tons of time to go through and change manually. And you can find out what these values are by using the listener. So now that we've created a simple tool, let's add it to our toolbar. It's a very simple process to add one of these scripts to your toolbar. You just select and drag it up onto your toolbar. You can see here that we've been given a, a new button that has a script little icon on it. If I go ahead and change the lids on these just so we can see what's up, and I click the button, you can see that the script is running. We can get to this by editing this macro script and it opens it up and here is our code. It's been put inside of a macro script which we can access later and this is stored in your app data folder of your max install. So let's go ahead and make a little toolbar to hold our function. I'm going to go ahead and customize. On the toolbar tab I'll say new. We call this demo. So now we have a new toolbar and you can see by the category here, drag and drop, if I go to category, drag and drop, here's our macro one. If I click and drag this onto here, now we have this macro, which is the same as this button on our own toolbar. Let's go ahead and delete this and just keep our little toolbar. Now, if you want to get to the file where this is saved, you go to your app data location. This is a location that Max and other software will store local things that you've made on your own computer, like location of Windows, the last location that you saved something. All of that stuff would be located in this app data folder. Now that I've shown you how to make a toolbar, let's go ahead and dock that there for later. I'm going to show you how to make a simple rollout floater. A rollout floater is a tool that will actually exist in the Max UI. You can move it around, execute it, share it with people, and design its own interface. It doesn't need to have its own toolbar. So to start out, let's define a rollout. So this rollout is what's going to contain our buttons and other UI elements. And then to give it a place to exist, we need to make a rollout floater. So this is a new variable we're declaring. This is an action that Max will perform to create a new floater. This is the name, its height, and its width. And then we just need to add our rollout to the rollout floater. So what this is telling Max is to add your whoops roll rollout template to your rollout floater. Let's execute this. And here we have it. This is your rollout, 
and this is the floater. Now let's add a button. I'm going to create a new button. This tells Max to make a button. This is the button's name, and this is the text that displays on the button. Now if I execute this again, you're going to see that we have our, our button right here, but we also have another rollout floater. And if I keep executing this, you're going to see that we're going to keep having more and more. So a very common line I include in all of my floaters, which also helps keep things from getting screwed up behind the scenes, is a uh, try catch. This is a method for Max to attempt to do something, and if it doesn't work, it won't mind. Typically, if a code errors, Max script will stop what it's doing to prevent your session from, from becoming corrupt or crashing Max itself. So let's go ahead and try. So Max script is going to try and close the window if it exists, and if not, just put the catch on the end and it'll do nothing. So if I execute this code, because we have no floaters running, it just makes it just fine. But if I execute it again, you can see that it kills the previous one and makes a new one. Now all we have to do is add a function to our button. This is what's known as an event handler. The script has been run, and now it's waiting for input. It can be an input of just about anything, but let's interact with our button, because that's what we've got. We're telling Max to say, when the, when the button is pressed, do this action, what's inside of these brackets. And I'm just going to have it make a box. So let's execute this code. Now we have a floater. And when we push this button, there's our box. There you have it. Those are a few methods for creating tools within 3D Studio Max and an intro into a little bit of Max script. All right, that's it for the video tutorial. I hope that uh, what we covered today is really going to help you expand your workflow into an area that you might not have been familiar with before and really utilize the power of MaxScript and making simple tools for 3D Studio Max. Thanks for watching.